that. Okay. <laughs> well, today's message is an introduction to what we will be studying in Mark chapter 13 over the next several weeks. I don't know how many weeks it'll be, but probably the whole month of June. And it's going to deal with the end times. And I'm just going to give you a, an overview of the end times over the month because all of chapter 13 deals with that. But this will be Jesus' perspective on what we can expect in the future, not only as a nation, but of what will be happening in the world according to God's prophetic plan. Though the days he describes are very dark, there's also some good news that most of us are not even aware of that I will get to at the end of the message. News that surprised me of what God is doing in this world. My hope is that we would be encouraged to stand for Jesus more faithfully when the winds of persecution reach America's shores and to continually, continually hope in him no matter how much the world will change. And we know the world is changing, don't we? We know it is. So I'm going to read the whole chapter, but we'll get into teaching it starting next week. Mark chapter 13. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you see the abomination that causes desolation, standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down or enter the house or take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter because those will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time, but in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. 
you do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Wow, there's a whole lot there, isn't there? I'm kind of intimidated to have to teach that over the next several weeks, but at least we'll have a good idea of what Jesus means when the end comes. What are we to look for? What is this all? It's going to be essentially the whole book of Revelation in one chapter. So that's quite a, quite a task, so pray for me. But Mark 13 deals with the return of Jesus and the events that lead up to his second coming. And if they seem bleak, it's because they are. We have been living in the last days since Jesus died, resurrected, and was taken up to heaven. If you didn't know that. People have been speculating ever since Jesus left this earth when his return might be. Have you ever heard any doomsday predictions? Of course. Now, the book of 2 Thessalonians was addressed to believers who thought that the second coming of Jesus had already happened while others thought he was coming soon. So you know what they did? They quit their jobs, they sat in their beach chairs, and they waited for Jesus to come back. So Paul had to write the book of 2 Thessalonians to say, no, get your butts in gear, get back to work, you'll know when he comes back. It seems that in every century there is some kook who predicts that Jesus is on his way next month or next year. Here are a few. In the second century, a man named Montanus said that Jesus' return was imminent. Many Christians left their homes and they moved to a plain in Turkey. German mathematician Johannes Stoffler predicted the world would end on February 25th, 1524 by a great flood which caused a huge panic. In fact, one man was so panicked about this doomsday prediction of a great flood, flood he built a three-story ark. On the day of the great flood, there was only a light rain. It's kind of like all those predictions of the great torrential rains coming to the hill country and you get like a mist. And then when they predict a sunny day, your house washes away. In 1666, the Great London Fire destroyed 87 churches and 13,000 houses. People thought it was the end of the world. Why? Because there was 666 in that year. Okay? 1666. Now, in 1806, this one's great. In 1806, a hen in Leeds, England, laid eggs that said, Christ is coming. Many people feared for that great day of judgment. They thought it was upon them because of this egg-laying hen that's with, whose egg said Christ is coming. Until they discovered the owner of the hen wrote the message on the eggs and reinserted them into the chicken. Ouch! <laughs> There's more. In 1910, Halley's Comet started an end times panic when it passed close to the earth. Headlines screamed, Comet may kill all Earth life, says scientists. Bottled air was a hot seller, okay? I've got some bottled air, okay, if you would like to buy some. And someone tried to sacrifice a virgin to prevent the impending doom that was to come because of Halley's Comet. Now, in 2012, people thought the Mayan calendar predicted the end of the world. Remember that one? But the worst predictors as a group are the Jehovah's Witnesses. They have predicted the end of the world in 1874, 1914, 1918, 1925, 1941, 1975, and 1995. Are you going to get any of them to admit it? No. But the worst forecaster, an individual, was a man named Harold Camping, who had predicted the end of the world over 12 times. After he died, his followers predicted it would end then, in 2015. He died in 2013, so his followers said, well, let's keep it going. 2015. And the latest date was last year on May 20th, but guess what? We're still here. Once again, American Christians are starting to believe that the end of the world is coming. I'm saying this, American Christians believe it's really now time for the world to end. You know why? 
because of the sea change that our country is going through. Some radical changes are happening in our country from its governmental structures to the new sexual revolution to the outrageous gender politics. And it's hilarious in one sense that just because trouble starts to come to America, now Jesus comes. Forget about the people who have experienced trouble like for thousands of years in China or, or, or the Middle East or any place where Jesus is proclaimed and it's illegal. Forget that. No, it's when it comes to America, Jesus is coming soon. I don't know when he's coming. And none of you know when he's coming. And Jesus said he's coming soon, and that was 2,000 years ago. But to the Lord, a day is like a 1,000 years, and a 1,000 years is like a day, right? So I say this. He ain't coming soon the way we look at it. It's going to be another 1,000 years from now. And if I'm wrong, I'll be happy because I'll be taken up to heaven, and so will y'all, right? So don't think just because it's getting bad in America. You know what? The gospel's still got to be proclaimed throughout the world, and it hasn't yet. That's why every week in the bulletins, I say, how, what percentage is evangelical in the country, and how many people are unreached? In France, 33% of the people are unreached. That means they haven't heard the gospel yet. Read your bulletin, look at that, and you can pray for those countries. I get a daily email that tells us of the countries we need to pray for, so you can pray for the entire world in a year. Jesus said this, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So what do you think Jesus means when he says no one knows? What do you think he means? No one knows. No one knows. How come these other people don't, I don't get it. Why don't people believe him? No one knows when the end will come. But if we look at how society is changing, it seems it may not be too much longer, but I think we've got a whole lot of stuff to go through. That's why we're all living in Johnson City, isn't it? Those changes don't come that fast, but they're coming fast here. Let me tell you something. You want to see how our world is changing in Johnson City? Go on the art walk. I'm not kidding you. Go on the art walk, and you'll know what I mean. Okay? You'll get a sense. Every century has produced the worst disasters ever. You know that? Every century has produced disasters. Paul gave this warning to a young pastor named Timothy. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be, actually, every time it sounds familiar, like it's happening now, say, check. Okay, I just want you to say check, so engage with me, all right? People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, Abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. That was written in the first century and it sounds like today, doesn't it? Today, magnified. It's amazing. John Calvin says this passage describes not bad times, but bad people. He wrote, we should note what the danger is. Not war, not famine, or diseases, nor any of the other calamities or ills that befall the body, but the wicked and depraved ways of men. Let me ask, does it seem like bad people are increasing? Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Sure does. Legalized abortion at any time is the main issue of a major political party up to and including birth and after birth. And what's, what's it called when you kill a baby outside the womb? Infanticide. And that is being promoted by a major political party now. They're all trying to see who can kill more babies, it seems? That makes no sense to me. I think, how can that be? Before, the issue used to be when life began. And you, people still argue about that. I say it's conception. But now, when a baby is alive and, it's just, and the baby is inconvenient, you can kill the baby? Is that evil or what? You know what they did in the Roman times? If they got a, woman, if they got a young girl, a baby girl, they would just take the baby and put it on the roadside. And there'd be babies lying on the roadside, just dying. In, in the six times in Rome, they would put them in um, rivers and they would send them off. Right, and they did that during Moses' time, didn't they? 
They were killing babies. The same party will not condemn anti-Semitism in its own ranks. Who would think that after the Holocaust that this threat to Jewish people would rise again? And in America, are you aware of that, y'all? Do you know, are you aware of that? That the people who are just screaming anti-Israel? Now, the Equality Act, I mentioned a little bit about that during announcement last week, and this is all part of the end times that I'm talking about here in America. It passed the House, which puts religious liberty at stake, threatening what we as Christians believe how we view marriage and sexuality and how we define male and female would be considered irrational, turning Billy Graham into Jim Crow, if you know about the Jim Crow laws. In other words, if out of conviction you did not want to use your skill of baking an artistic cake for a gay wedding like Jack Phillips in Colorado did, it would be illegal. You know, he went to court and they found that he did not have to use his artistic expression to violate his conscience. The Equality Act will make it illegal for you to go with your conscience. Understand that. Let me give you some more examples. The Equality Act would compel you to say things you didn't believe. If you chose to use the word he in reference to a male who says he's a she, that would be illegal. That would be illegal. Now, my daughter and I were talking about this, and she goes, well, why wouldn't we just call that person a he? I go, well, I would. I would. But some people may, their conviction is, it's not a he. No he ever becomes a she. You don't understand that, right? Scientifically, biologically, it's impossible. It's impossible, and no she can ever become a he. And some of your conscience, maybe I can't call you a she because you're a ye. I would do it just to be gracious. But if someone should choose not to, imagine that being illegal, being fined, and even being jailed for that. And that is happening. That is happening. The Equality Act would make that illegal. More, parental rights would be jeopardized. How? If your child wants to transition to the opposite sex and you refuse the treatments to make it happen, the child could be taken from your home, and this has already happened. In Ohio, a judge removed a biological girl from her parents' custody after they declined to help her transition to male with testosterone supplements. So let me, let me, let me explain something here that you may already know. I talked to Dee Dee about this some more. You know, she's encountering all this political foolishness on her campus, the formerly Baptist camp campus of Baylor, that when kids become preteens, their hormones are going crazy. And they don't know what they believe. And they get confused for a season of time sexually. This law would allow for them to act out on their foolish impulses and compel you as a parent to get medical treatment to transition them. That's pretty radical. That's pretty radical. More, if you are a doctor who will not perform a hysterectomy on a woman who identifies as a man, that would be illegal. That would be illegal. Christians will have to ask themselves if they can really enter into mainstream professions like law and medicine with a cultural shift that is taking place. What if you as a doctor are forced to perform abortions or euthanasia? Would you do it? You spent eight years in education and another year or two in internship, and now you've devoted that segment of your life, 10 years of your life, and now you have to go against your conscience to do something you know is wrong, putting to death an older person, or putting, and sometimes without their will, even. This is, these are bad things that are happening. This is why I am strongly suggesting that you vote against it. Now, right now, it's, it's the House. The House has passed it. The Senate, it's going before the Senate, but eight senators have already said, all they need is eight senators to cross over. Then if the president doesn't sign it, it doesn't become law. But what happens in the next election when all three branches of government become one political party? It's going to pass. So this is very real. It's something that's important. 
Now I'm speaking from a moral issue, which I can do legally, but you know where I'm coming from. My job as a pastor is to warn you of the times we live in and to, and to put everything that you read about and the laws that are coming before us and, and compare it to scripture and how does that work. A cardiologist wrote this in the New York Times, to avoid such conflicts, medical students who foresee problems of conscience should steer clear of certain fields such as obstet obstetrics, gynecology, when making career choices. They're saying that already. What if as a lawyer you are forced to defend positions on gender that you disagree with and find morally reprehensible? Make no mistake about it. These are all aimed at people of faith, particularly the Christian faith. 1 Timothy 3, 12 to 13 says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. If you are a godly Christian, an authentic Christian, living your life as a Christian, you will be persecuted. That is a promise. If you live your life and you're a nice guy, a nice woman, and you're just being friendly and letting your little light shine, no one's going to persecute you. But if you tell them the reason why you're nice, the reason why you're gracious is because you believe in Jesus Christ, watch what happens then. Watch what happens then. Do you understand that these might be the very last days of the last days? They could be. Worse, worse. What if this is only the beginning of the last days? It's one thing if this is the worst of the worst. What if it's just the beginning? Now you know why so many faithful believers throughout the years have cried this, come Lord Jesus. Can you, can you relate? Can you say it? Come Lord Jesus. Come Lord Jesus. Except there's a problem here. If Jesus came today, all your unsafe friends and family members and neighbors and coworkers will go to hell. So we're kind of stuck on a selfish level, we say, come Lord Jesus, take me out of this place. But on the other hand, we have, you young couples, you have 30, 40, 50 years to serve Jesus. Me, I have about 25. My kids laugh. Dad, you're talking about death. I go, I turned 60 and I, all of a sudden I started thinking, man, I got to get my affairs in order. Why? George, General George Patton died at 60. Carrie Fisher died at 60. Shemp! The fourth stooge died at 60. Sergio Leone, who directed the Spaghetti Westerns, died at age 60. I could die. I don't even have a guy to take my... Tom. Y'all saw it. Tom. You take my place. Okay? So, but I'm thinking, Lord, I only have 25 more years. I'll be 85. Maybe 30. 90. This is the only time that we have to serve Jesus Christ on this earth and to make a difference. We'll be serving him in a different way in heaven, but the only time in this human flesh that we can make a difference for Jesus Christ. I implore you, serve him, live for him now. Don't wait, don't wait. There's nothing more important that you can do than to serve him now. Mark 13, 13, the chapter we're looking at, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. You got that? It doesn't mean you're going to lose your salvation. What this means is you know you're a Christian if you continue to persevere through that persecution. If you continue to stand strong and stand up for him and not deny him, right? This is radical Christianity. Radical Christianity. Let me ask you, are you willing to take a stand for Jesus? Yes or no? Yes. Will you persevere? Yes, you will, because God is able to make you stand. Community Church of the Hills has been here for 36 years. What will happen in the next 36 years? You may have me for 30 more years. I hope so. I don't want to go anywhere else. I'm, I'm laying down my roots. I'm saying, this is it. I'm going to die here. Um, Lonnie, can, can, I, can, can you guys just give me a little plot? Just throw me in, put there, and a tree, an oak tree, and a, some deer antlers, OK? <laughs> what will happen in the next 36 years? I don't know, but stay faithful. 
Stay faithful. Gosh, stay faithful. You know, this church was founded because the church that the founding members went to were not faithful. The church in town, new pastor came in, denied the deity of Jesus Christ, said all roads lead to heaven in a multicultural, in a multicultural environment. We can't say that there's only one way that leads to heaven. And I can't believe it. Can you imagine? They left that church one by one. They didn't like leave in one big exodus. And they, they sent letters to the denomination. They pleaded saying, no, we want this. They were castigated. They were made fun of, I suppose. They, were, they didn't like it, did they? But they stood their ground. And they left one by one. They did it, they did it graciously. One week they leave. Another, then they met by the pool community pool, right? Then they met at your house. Oh. And then they pooled their money, their own money, and built this church. If you don't know the history, that's pretty awesome. And then it just filled up, didn't it? Thousands of people came, huh? <laughs> no. Then the real trials came. So understand, this church was founded on the conviction that the Bible needs to be taught. And if I ever stray from the Bible, you need to go. But I'm very careful. I'm very careful about what I teach because this is my life. This is your life. This is God's word. And I'm not going to play around. That's why we celebrate 36 years of faithfulness. Okay, I want to conclude with some good news. Want some good news? Right? It's pretty much of a downer, right? But I, when you hear this, this is great. This is from a book called The Myth of the Declining Church by Glenn Stanton. It just came out. He works for Focus on the Family. Given all this bad news, you may be wondering, well, the church must be shrinking, right? You think that? Is it slowly fading away, preparing us for the end to come? Yes and no. Yes and no. It depends on what part of the church you're talking about. People are leaving the mainline denominations in droves. They're leaving the Presbyterian church, the Methodist church, the Episcopalian church. They're leaving the big mainline denominations. Why? Because they're compromising their faith. They deny the deity of Jesus Christ. They deny the reality of the resurrection. They deny the inerrancy of this word. And every time, according to this study, this man did, and he went through uh, renowned scholars to do this, every time the churches became more liberal, people would leave. You think, oh, they're trying to, you know, they're trying to just appeal to the masses and gay marriages and, and gay clergy and that'll break. No, they keep shrinking. And that's why we were founded here. The good news is that evangelical churches and non-denominational churches have been holding steady and have been growing since the 70s. Harvard research, Harvard, no bastion of conservative thought. You understand that, right? <laughs> okay. They did this research that said this, evangelicals are not in decline. That was a quote. Evangelicals are not in decline. We have grown from 18% of the population in 1972 to about 28% just recently. That's a, that's a pretty good growth. The bottom line, churches who compromise the truth are declining. Churches who hold fast to the word and take it literally are growing. There are mega churches in nearly every town. You know that? Mega churches don't arise out of a declining Christian culture. Do you know... Austin Ridge. You've heard of Austin Ridge? Big church in Bee Cave. Well, they're breaking ground and next week to build another campus east of Dripping Springs because they're growing so much. And Art's been there. Thousands of people, right? And they teach the word. I'm amazed. So that's good news. I just don't want to make a church coming to this town, okay? But praise God, if they should, more people are reached, okay, that's fine. How is the church doing around the world? Exploding, booming, 
hundredfold increases in Africa and Asia. These churches promote faithful biblical Christianity, and this research is from scholars who don't usually use hyperbole. Exploding, booming, hundredfold increases. You know why? Where people are being persecuted for the faith, that's when God grows those churches. More conservative, listen to this, more conservative theological seminaries have been built in Africa in the last 10 to 15 years than in all the rest of the world combined. Isn't that amazing? And this isn't health and wealth crazy stuff. This is conservative biblical Christianity. It's okay if you say amen. I mean, amen. Praise God. Why is this happening though? Why would this happen? Because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Who is building the church? The Holy Spirit of God. He has not stopped working. He will continue to move throughout the world and throughout the ages, no matter what puny little sinful man does. He's going to accomplish his purposes. Acts 2.47, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Who added to the church? The Lord. And the Lord will continue to add to his church. Now, who worships God at the end of time? Half a dozen people? Three, seven, 20, 160 people. Revelation 7, 9 through 10, multitudes. Listen to this. After this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands, and they were shouting with a great roar, Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. Multitudes of people. God's not done. God said that his word would not return void, but will accomplish the purpose he has set out for it to do. If people were not hearing and responding, then God's word would be returning empty. So what can you do to ensure that Christ's church continues to grow all the way up until Jesus returns? Guess, what can you do? What can you do? Huh? You can praise the Lord, but what can you do so that it increases? Ah, imagine sharing the J word with someone. The J word? No. How about if I just say Lord? Uh, how about if I say God? I believe in God. Well, no one cares if you believe in God, really. Share Jesus. Everyone must pass their faith on to others. They must. Parents, you must pass on your faith to your children. This is how. Live out your faith honestly and authentically. Honestly and authentically. Pray and read and talk about the Bible with your kids. Integrate your faith with your life. And go to church regularly. 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 Can you say that? Regularly. Only 12% of people who left the faith in adulthood said they had any kind of real measurable faith in childhood. Only 12%. 88% of kids who say they grew up in a Christian home ended up continuing to go to church because they saw it faithfully lived out in their homes. My daughter Dee Dee doesn't have to go to church anymore, but she does. She can't not. You raise up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. Whatever habit you teach them, they will not depart. That's why it's so important you bring your kids to church. You fall asleep, fine, but bring your kids to church. Let them see you faithfully sleeping in church. <laughs> This is true, though, in any kind of family. Think about it. If you grow up in a cowboy family, guess what? Your kids grow up to be, well, even though the song says, mamas. <laughs> or if you grow up in a sports family, right? A hunting family, an academic family, there's a strong likelihood that the kids will grow up doing the same things. What people were in the past is what they tend to be for good or bad in the future. Research shows that there's a strong likelihood that if you live out your faith, your kids will too. I am releasing my daughter. I've released Dee Dee two years on her own and now <laughs> Laurel. But I can trust God. I have raised her up in the way she should go. And I'm trusting that God will keep her. 
Plus, I have the purse strings the first year. She's got to go to church. And she must be in Young Life. A must. That's a must. Or no, or she'll be eating top ramen for a year. <laughs> the challenge for everyone here today is that we live out our faith authentically and biblically. I'm going to close with these verses, of the last verses of Mark 13. Be on your guard. Keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake! If you sleep in church, stay awake! That's why I make, I'm making coffee for the next few months before, until Bill Vaughn comes back. I make my coffee strong, huh, Leslie? Stronger, have you noticed? Because I want you to stay awake! It's biblical. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Let's pray and worship God one more time. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the good news that we hear. We know that the world crumbles around us, but it's been crumbling pretty much since Adam and Eve were here. So, Lord, we have to be faithful. And you're able to make us faithful. You're able to make us stand strong. We ask that you fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we would stand strong in the midst of persecution, frustrations, the daily struggles of life, because you are real and you are worth it. We love you, Lord, and we praise you once again as I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.